Hi guys, thanks for joining me. This is This Vet Wants You to Know. I'm Dr. Ayele Okine, a veterinary internal medicine specialist, and today we're gonna to talk about fungal disease. Luke might be in the background giving his two cents as well. The first fungal organism that I wanna talk about is one called coccidioides. It's a fungal organism that we primarily see on the west coast and the southwest. Um, it exists in the soil and it can affect dogs and cats, but we primarily see it in dogs. Clinical signs associated with this fungal organism often include um, pneumonia, so basically respiratory symptoms, coughing, labored breathing, um, you know, symptoms like that. We typically will find that they'll have a fever on presentation as well, and often the pneumonia and the fever don't respond to antibiotics because again, fungal organisms are not gonna respond to antibiotics. And so often they get referred to us for pneumonia uh, that persists despite antibiotic treatment. Testing for coccidiomycosis often involves antibody testing of the blood. And that can be very helpful to distinguish between active infection and previous exposure. Other ways of diagnosing the fungus are on biopsy samples. So in some cases, this fungus can cause skin lesions. And so you can see it in the biopsy samples or if doing an airway wash. So basically as an internal medicine specialist, we will often do uh, a test called bronchoscopy, where we actually go into the lungs with a camera under general anesthesia. We instill a little bit of sterile saline into the airways and suck that fluid back out. And with that fluid comes any inflammatory cells, we'll get any bacteria if it happens to be there, and then obviously the fungus, which is what we're talking about now. So that can be picked up in the samples as well. However, we often will do blood testing because a lot of our patients are too sick for anesthesia. We also can do a tracheal wash, which is basically not involving putting a camera into the airway, but instead under some sedation, uh, using a small catheter into the windpipe, putting a little bit of fluid there and sucking it back out. So that can be done without general anesthesia, but again, you're washing more of the upper airways and so you're uh, reducing your chances of getting an answer that way. So uh, I can only think of one case where uh, we had a patient that was too unstable for general anesthesia. And so we went with the tracheal wash, um, but there's still risk involved with that as well. Treatment involves antifungal medication. So oral medications that are taken there are some injectable uh, antifungal medications that can be used in emergency situations, uh, but that type of antifungal medication can uh, affect the kidneys. And so we often have to be very careful with who we select for those types of medications. Treatment for fungal organisms in general tends to be long-term or even lifelong because of how slowly the fungus replicates. Our goal of treatment is to either eradicate the fungus from the body completely or to get it in such low levels that with a combination of medication and the immune system things will stay under control and things aren't getting worse and the pet can feel good and kind of go on with a normal life. What we use to determine whether or not we're done with treatment is either treating for six months or so after the evidence of infections gone. So that could be, you know, x-rays, um, that could be, you know, skin clearing up, that sort of thing. But ideally it would be for at least six months after the antibody levels go to zero. And so if we have a patient that has a positive antibody, we can use that to measure treatment success. Um, and that also can tell us whether or not we're relapsing after treatment is done. Aspergillus is another fungal disease that we can see in both dogs and cats. Primarily, again, we see it in dogs. Most often, it affects the nasal cavity, primarily of long-nosed dogs, but we also can see it in uh, cats and dogs that inhale uh, plant material, especially foxtails over in the West Coast. A lot of those plant material, especially if they're kind of spiky, 
they can take any fungal spores that they may have on them and actually seed the nasal cavity leading to uh, infection. So we call that fungal rhinitis. In some animals we can see systemic aspergillus, but it's pretty uncommon. German shepherds tend to be predisposed to having that happen. And in that case, the fungus can go anywhere. Bone, it can be in the bloodstream, it can be in different organs. Um, and so that is a, a pretty nasty disease with a really high mortality. As far as the nasal aspergillosis, oftentimes these patients are presenting with nasal discharge. Typically, it's a lot of nasal discharge, and in some cases, it's actually bloody. Um, it's one of our top differentials for a bloody nose and a, and a dog or cat, um, kind of second to tumor, depending on the age. When we see a patient that has nasal uh, discharge and nasal bleeding, often we're recommending doing a CT scan, a CAT scan, to actually get slices all the way through the nose into the brain so that we can determine the severity and the extent of disease and also kind of localize where the lesions are so that we can get a better look with rhinoscopy. Rhinoscopy involves taking a camera into the nasal passages and actually taking a look around. And with that, we can actually guide some biopsy samples. In some cases, depending on how severe the CT findings are, we can actually get biopsies using the CT as a guide. In some cases, um, once we get our biopsy samples, we also will collect samples for culture, and that could be bacterial culture. There's some um, special bacteria that have to be cultured separately, and then also fungal cultures. If we're highly suspicious of aspergillosis, there's also some blood testing that can be done looking for antibody levels. Uh, we also can, uh, there's the availability of like PCR, so DNA testing for the fungus. So there's a number of ways to get a diagnosis, but again, often we're getting it either from an antibody test in the blood or potentially from a culture or even on biopsy samples from the nose. Treatment for nasal aspergillosis uh, can involve either oral medications, so there's actually some newer antifungal medications that seem to have efficacy for nasal disease. How I explain it to people is that the nose is such a small area that in some cases our medications don't reach there, or even when we're doing antibody testing, sometimes they won't mount an antibody response because if the lesions are just localized to the nose, it may not signal the rest of the body that there's disease there. So we're moving a little bit more towards using oral antifungal medications for these patients, but kind of the gold standard tried and true treatment is actually instilling clotrimazole, which is a antifungal medication similar to like the athlete's foot medication. So a cream um, that actually can be instilled into the nasal cavity under general anesthesia and treated topically. The vast majority of patients that undergo that will have a, a cure potentially in one or two treatments. Uh, but again, it's expensive when you go through the process of doing all those diagnostics and then having to do you know, a procedure like this, it can rack up quite a cost. And so I think that's where using oral antifungal medications is very attractive. Treatment with oral antifungals, again, same sort of thing as with coccidiomycosis and some of these other fungal organisms, treatment often is long-term or even lifelong because, again, um, it can be difficult for the immune system to eradicate it. Again, typically you want to treat beyond uh, resolution of the signs or uh, having a negative antibody test.